Welcome, Jim. And may I ask you when you were born? 8 9 1925. And where were you born? Uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Your current address? Shrewsbury, Mass. Thank you. And your marital status? Uh, married and with uh, two, ch two children. Good for you. When and where did you enter the military? Uh, I entered it at Fort Devens. And then they put us on a train. They, they, we drove a train all the way down to Alabama. And uh, that's... Can I ask you, um, I, I take it, because you, you went to Fort Devens, you were in the United States Army. Right, right. Why were you in the Army instead of one of the other forces? Well, uh, I wasn't too thrilled about being a Marine, but anyway, in the Navy, uh, I, I couldn't swim anyway, so I feel I don't want to go in the Navy. <laughs> you were being very, very prudent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and where did you uh, enlist? Uh, they drafted me in uh, the Worcester Draft Board. I was living in Worcester at the time, Worcester, Mass. And what was the date? Oh, I don't know. Was Just roughly? In December of uh, 43. December of 43? So, yeah, I didn't go in until 44 because uh, we stayed home like for New Year's and Christmas. Uh, you know. So in early 1944, you're on a train. What, what do they do to you at uh, Fort Devens? They did only uh, like give you clothes and things like that. That's about all they do. Just did. shape you they, up as a unit. They put yeah. us on, no, just put us all on the train and then we went down to Fort Devens. I mean, Fort McClellan, Alabama. That's what okay. we went. Okay, had to. you ever been out of the Boston area before that? Uh, not, well, I mean, visiting different places, but not that far. Had you ever been in the Deep South before that? No, that was an experience okay. right there. Tell us about that. Some guys pass over that lightly, but that's really a cultural <coughs> change. Well, it was for me one day when I was uh, going into town. The bus pulled up. I get on the bus. And normally, I go all the way to the back and sit down. And the bus driver says, no, no, come up here. You've got to sit in front. You can't sit in the back. So that was uh, one of the things. That's one of the first things you learned. Yeah. Yeah. What did you do down there at McClellan? <coughs> What kind of training did you get at Fort uh, Infantry training. It was all infantry training. And then uh, one day when I was uh, doing the obstacle course, you know, they have a little moat with water in it there, and you grab the cord, you swing across the moat. But I didn't quite make it on the other side. I hit my knee, and it looked like I had two kneecaps, so they sent me into the hospital for that. And you, went, you wound up in a hospital because yeah, I was you in the injured hospital yourself. Yeah, rehabilitation for a while, and then they uh, said that I wasn't, didn't have enough basic training time in the unit I was with, so they put me with another unit, which was all Southerners. So that was an experience in itself. <laughs> Your records show that you uh, were working eventually with, with heavy machine guns. Yeah. Um, where in the course of, of your training was it decided, and how was it decided, I, what kind of weapons you'd specialize in? I, I don't really know, because uh, I have a medal that says machine gun on it and something else, but whether I, when I ran, where I shot it in the basic training at the target, whether I hit the target more than I did anything else, I don't know. Is a heavy considered a 50 caliber rather than a 30 or what? No, it was a 30 caliber. It was one that, when I was in the service, uh, when I was further on in, in, in Italy there, it was one you could carry on your shoulder. And, Is this air-cooled or water-cooled? Yeah, air-cooled. Okay. Yeah. And you got good at it. You were hitting targets. Well, apparently. <laughs> what else did you do in basic training? Uh, that's about all there was. The, we just, you know, did the, uh, the normal uh, everyday routine where you had to go out and do this, do that, and exercises and walks and, and the march, you know. At the end of the uh, amount of time, they uh, give you a, uh, like a, walk, a march for so many miles out and so many miles back. And because uh, I hadn't done too much walking because I had injured my knee, but I, I made the walk all right, but it was. Uh, were you the only Yankee in this southern unit? I, I'm not positive of that, but I'm telling you, it was an experience because, you know, if, if one said something, they all were behind the other person. 
they even broke into my foot locker and everything else. Let's look at that a moment. Were you treated not well because you were a, a northerner in I, a I would think so, southern yeah. unit? The war was still going on, I think, down in the south. So this is, you suffered a form of discrimination? Yes, yes. They didn't beat me up or anything like that, but you know, they were. Well, they made you eat grits and things yeah, like that, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What did you do uh, when your training was coming to an end? Uh, were you formed into units? No, they weren't. Uh, they just uh, had all the unit. They would ship it up. We went from uh, Fort McClellan, we went to Fort Meade, and then we went to another camp just down the road down here, Miles Standish. Oh, right down here right at Plymouth. Right down the yeah. road a little ways. We yeah. stayed there and then waiting for a, a ship to come into Boston to take us over to England. And now, the commander of the ship was Jack Dempsey. Oh, hang on to that for a second. <laughs> um, how, how long were you at McClellan getting all this infantry training? Well, I, I don't remember the exact date, but like I say, I, I did the first one and then they said, well, you don't have enough time, so you just had to go into another unit. And then, of course, as soon as the unit was there for so many weeks, they ship you out. I guess the question I'm, I'm really asking you is, uh, you're, you're poised now to get on a ship and go overseas into yeah. combat. Yeah. Uh, how long was your training? It seems like it, it was very short. Well, it uh, probably wasn't that short because it's just so many, it's so many weeks they give you, you know, but I don't remember how many weeks it was they were going to, you know, have you down there. But after a certain period, then you have the march at the end of your tour of duty like, and then after that they ship you out. Okay. Can you look back and, and tell us, um, did you feel you were ready, that you were fully prepared to go into combat? You could take that gun apart and put it back together? Oh, and every, oh, all that, that, that was a lot of the training, especially, not so much in the machine gun, but the rifles, we, more or less we were like had rifles when we were down there. Yeah. And you, you know, you're supposed to, a lot of people could just get blindfolded and pick them all apart and put them right back together again. But. Were you using M1s at the time? Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us tactically how a, a light, a heavy machine gun fits into a platoon? What were you supposed to do? Well, uh, we to, if we could see people out there when we, you know, if they're going, so going along, if there was people out there that were shooting at us, we would shoot back at them. That what was, was your, What was the range of this, this gun? It was probably it was probably less than you thought it was. You know what I mean? You were firing a gun out there, yeah. and uh, we were up in the Massa Italy, and uh, we were in this whole this house. And we we're firing out the window, and all of a sudden the gun jammed, the machine gun jammed, and they have a special tool. You know, you flip the gun, cartridge on. Nobody had a great. We had to finally force it out with a knife. We're, we're getting our, ahead of ourselves just yeah. a second here. I guess I have to ask you about Jack Dempsey. Uh, you got on a ship where? In Boston Harbor, right next to the fish pier. It was really? right next to the fish pier. And uh, the Coast Guard ship went all alone. I guess it zigzagged a little bit, but it was, didn't have any escort or anything like that. I went over to England. And about how many guys were with you? Oh, I, gee, I have no idea how many people were on there, but I know it was a, a good-sized ship. Really crowded. And you said Jack Dempsey was a, an officer on the ship? He was a commander, yeah, of the Coast Guard. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he used to uh, come down the deck every day, you know, and of course all these people thought, oh, well, I'll knock him out, nothing flat, you know. They're picking themselves off the deck. <laughs> Did you try this? No, not me. <laughs> not me. I had his autograph on a dollar bill, but I don't know what happened to the dollar bill. Oh, somebody's it. got it today, I'm sure. Yeah. You went over without escort. Right. Uh, how did you go? Did you go up to Halifax and cross? Or? No, I think we just went straight across to England. How long did it take you? Yeah, it was only about a week, I think, seven days. Pretty fast ship. Yeah, yeah. Okay, was it there any time um, 
You felt threatened either by uh, air or submarines? No, there was nothing. It just seemed to be going merrily along. There was no problem there. And, and about what time was, it, was this? So what date? Oh, I don't, I'd have to, I'm not sure of the date. I haven't, I haven't really... Uh, uh, if you went in at 43 and 40, early 44, and you spent about three, four months in boot camp. Yeah, well, I think, be the yeah, spring I, of think I guess it was around September. 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 Yeah. Okay. Now you think of it. So we've already had D Day. Yes, that's so, when I was in uh, D Day. Was when I was in uh, doing basic training down there. They announced that they had invaded. Okay. And everybody, of course, thought, well, the war's going to be over, and I won't have to worry about going over there. Where did you land in England? Uh, I'm not just sure what beach it is, but oh, on England we just uh, I think it was Liverpool, and then they they uh, bust us down to a uh, like a staging area, more or less, until they were getting ready to ship us across the channel. So they're kind of pushing you pretty fast over to oh, the yeah, theater of operations. Fast, yeah. uh, do you remember where or how you left England? Uh, we left on a, a a small ship. It wasn't that big. It seemed almost like a tugboat to me, but it was a little bigger than that. Yeah. But anyway, they just went right across and. And we get off, I don't know if it was Omaha or whatever anyway, but we got up off onto the land where there was a wide docking area where they were bringing all the supplies in. And then of course we walked up the hill to go uh, to, uh, uh, you know, some staging area where they were going to take us. And as you got to the top of the hill, you saw all these white crosses, which was not a very good thing to see when you first got over there. So you landed at a port rather than on a beach? Uh, it was, wasn't, no, it was, uh, they had brought, uh, when they made the, sh where the ships were unloading, they had ferries there and all kinds of ships sunk like, and they had like a platform right down the middle. These were the mulberries off of uh, Omaha then? Yeah, off of yeah. Omaha, whatever, right. I don't, but that was like ferries and everything else, they were all sunk over there to make a harbor for them. What was, uh, I know it's a long time ago, what was your feeling about stepping ashore in, in this pretty historic place? Yeah, well, like I say, when, uh, when you get up the beach and you start getting up to the top there and you see all the white crosses and you say, oh, you know, you don't realize until you're there, you're in it, you know what I mean, more or less. But of course, they had gone quite a ways inland by that time. What was your outfit told to do? What was your objective? All we did was, uh, they took a whole bunch of us uh, to a, like a little depot, more or less, a little camp area there where we had to wait, and they put us on an airplane and flew us to Italy. <laughs> you know, I've spent all my time running around here and there and everywhere. Okay, but that's, that's interesting that they took that route, but beyond that, um, I think we fit here fail to ask often enough what was in the sky over you? Uh, what planes did you see? What no, kind of action did you no, see? No, at that time there was a, it wasn't anything going on there because they, uh, uh, the first time we were supposed to fly to Italy, we got to the plane, the plane had a flat tire, so we had to just lay over another day. And there was, I think, two airplanes there. One took off and the other had to wait till they fixed the tire. Then they, we got on the plane and they put all these buckets down in the middle of the aisle, you know, <laughs> in case you decided to throw up on the airplane. So that was, you know, they kind of bounce around a C-47. And, uh, but it, the weather was bad, so they just flew outside to Paris and landed the plane again. And all the officers or whatever they are, they got off and they went into Paris, but we stayed on the airplane. Oh, really? Yeah. How <laughs> different, huh? <laughs> They saw their chance, I guess, to get into Paris, so they, yeah. they took it. Are you telling us that you sat in a plane till your officers came back? We came back Paris? overnight, and then the next day they took off. We flew into Italy. Where'd you land in Italy? Uh, that I'm not sure of where I landed in Italy. I, I, I really can't remember the name of the town or anything like that, you know. How far south, I guess? Uh, I don't think it was. Yeah. I don't think it was too far south. Uh, it had to be. 
I would say maybe even with Florence out to the coast there, somewhere they had a, some kind of an airport out there. I, I'm not just sure. Even just with what Florence. It was. Well, I'm just saying that as a as a reference yeah. point. You know so I mean? you were pretty far north of Rome by that yeah, time. Yeah, And the date now is about the end of 1944. Four, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you're approaching one of the worst winters in Europe. Well, yeah, we uh, we went there for uh, like a depot, and then they reassigned replacements to outfits that needed replacements. That's what it was. And we went up to a, uh, a mountain. That's when I was in Fire and Zola. We went up. We were up there, and uh, that was in the winter. That was the fall into the winter because it was all. We were in snow up there in the winter time, and uh, being a machine gunner, I didn't have to go on the patrols. But the other people that had regular guns, they went on patrol. Somebody one day stood you out in front of a barracks or somewhere. And they said to you, this, okay, this is what we're going to do. What was your objective? What, what were you guys trying to do with your guns? When we got up there, we were just kind of like a, it was like what you might call the front line. We were just kind of guarding it, you know, make sure the Germans didn't come in or anything like that. Because that's why they would go on, on patrols at night to make sure there wasn't any infiltration going on there. So at this point in the war, the Germans were largely out of Italy. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would, I don't know that they were really out of Italy because uh, we went from that spot, then we went to another, uh, Luzano and Belvedere, we went, we went left there and came up to there and there we were in a town and the observation post was the top of a church tower. So <laughs> I never liked to climb a lot of heights but I, I did come up in the church tower. Now, was and this, you this could see out there. Every morning you get up and you look and there'd be another sign out there about fascists or something like that, you know. But you never saw anybody. And if you fired a mortar shell at them, next you know there'd be a couple coming back, but you never saw anybody. Is this the incident you told us about earlier? Your gun jammed? No, no, this no? is further, okay. this is later on. This is before that. We were going, we, uh, we back, pulled back out of there, then we put us over to the, more or less the front lines there where they were going to start their spring offensive to go up the rest of the way in Italy. How cold was it? It was, there was a lot of snow out there. There was a lot of snow out there. Were, were your uniforms uh, adequate for what you were uh, facing? I wasn't, I don't remember being all cold, no. Because I was, as I say, I wasn't going out, I was more or less staying in the building, but they, it was adequate clothing. Were you issued a top coat? Uh, I think it was just a, uh, like a jacket that was maybe insulated or something like that, but not a top. Not, I don't think I had a coat. Okay. When you did go out, are you lugging this machine gun around? <laughs> no, no. I just uh, kind of stayed there because uh, I don't think they, they were in fear of anybody coming, you know. All right. You're in a defensive perimeter. Yeah, then. defensive, right. yeah. Tell us again about being up in the tower. Who's putting up these signs? Yeah. Well, I don't know. We, we went back to this, uh, we had to go up to this Lausanne in Belvedere, and we had to walk up because apparently there wasn't a uh, well-defined road or it could have been under, you know, attack or something like that. So we went up there and uh, we were just kind of holding the town, but they used the church steeple. They blasted a hole through the back of the steeple and then they put a ladder up so you can get up like where the church bell was and you look out and see the, out, you know, see the outside out there. But uh, every now and then you see a different sign maybe come up, but I never saw anybody. I never saw anybody. They did show, throw a few mortars over. They had a couple of uh, donkeys that uh, used to haul the supplies up there. They hit a couple of donkeys. But other than that, I never saw anybody. It's real, it was really weird, but you know, you look and you look, you, you don't see anything. Are there any books about the war? Um, I'm thinking of uh, Abel Fredano. Other books that pretty well describe what you went through up there and your units and this part of the... Were you in the 5th Army? This is the 5th Army, yeah. but this was the uh, 473rd Infantry. Is there anybody has has captured in literature what you went through there? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. 
we were originally we were a uh, uh, 443rd Infantry, uh, not infantry, uh, anti-aircraft. At the time, uh, there wasn't any planes flying over, so I decided they didn't need the anti-aircraft anymore, so that's when they pushed us right into the infantry. You're getting up against that date. Where did you begin to hear about the Battle of Bastogne and the Battle of the Bulge and yeah. the Ardennes? And did you hear about that where you were? I, I'm not. I'm not positive on that. But anyway, uh, when we felt like we say when we were in that last outpost there, they called us back down. They and they said they were going to start their spring offensive. You know, so we were all getting ready for that. And they had a place they called like no man's land there. The truck drivers would we'd get on the truck and they they zoom through and drop us off, and the truck would zoom back because they, they said the road was under under fire, and that's when we kind of started the spring offensive. Okay, you're into 45 now, so yeah, uh, the last spring of the war. Yeah. What then was was your objective? Where were you guys going? We were just Straight going north, or, or where? We were just going up al al along the coast, and the uh, first town that we really took was massive in Italy, and uh, we were just going along. We first when I first went into combat. Uh, we were going along this road, and there was a tank on the road, also a small tank that was kind of following with us. And they had apparently it was, it was supposed to have cleared all the mines out of the road, but the tank went down a little draw, and boom, <laughs> the track came right off the tank. But anyway, they were throwing so much stuff in it, the leaves were coming right off the trees, you know? I mean, it was almost like it was raining. There was so much stuff coming down the, through the trees there. What kind of opposition uh, were uh, you fighting against here? They, we didn't at that time. We didn't see anybody, but uh, one time we, uh, when we were going there, and there was like a, I don't know, almost like a shed or something, but it was all f fortified on the inside with all kinds of bricks and cement and stuff like that. And next, you know, the they were shooting at us. We were in there, and they were bullets were coming down the chimney. And the lieutenant, uh, one of the lieutenants, had a phone. He says, "Tell them to stop shooting at us! Tell them to stop shooting at us!" And they finally stopped. Oh, this is friendly fire. The friendly fire was at yeah. us. Yeah. I, I'm glad the phone worked. <laughs> but, yeah, I guess they couldn't have hurt the building because the building was pretty, pretty thick, you know. But I'm saying it was, they were stuff was bouncing right down the chimney. You mentioned the coast a minute ago. Uh, specifically, you're on, you're on the west coast. Uh, on, I, guess we, I don't know, if you're coming up Italy, this would, yeah, that side there, that would okay. be like the West Coast, right. yeah. We had gone uh, past Pizza and we were kind of dug in and getting ready to just start the offensive. Did you see the tower when you went through town? I went there and I went up the stairs and I think it's 310 steps. Good I for you. I'm going to do that if I'm going by there. So I didn't make it lean. It was already lean when I got there. Okay, so we're not <laughs> going to blame you for that any longer. <laughs> I understand you were wounded. Can yeah, well, we were. We had taken uh, Massa, and of course we were we were going along, and uh, we crossed a small river. And we were going. We 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 uh, we saw these rows of houses there. So next we we all went in the houses and. They were shooting at the enemy and stuff like that, and uh, finally we came out of the house, and there was a big box on the front step. I says, "Well, I hope nobody nobody stepped on it because it looked like it would have gone boom, you know." But fortunately, nobody stepped on it. But I'm sure it was a mine box that was sitting there. And then we went back a little further, and it was a big stone wall, like from I don't know from here to maybe the other side of the the church there, and we're all sitting down resting. About 100 and I yards. happen to be yeah. looking way down the end down there, and I see some Germans run by with a machine gun. <laughs> so I says, "What's going on here?" You know. So we waited till it was dark, and then they retreated a little bit. During all this, what weapon are you carrying? I'm carrying a machine gun. You're carrying the machine yeah, gun. Yeah, I'm carrying it. And I had a man that was with me, who was supposed to be carrying ammunition. When the Germans 
are at the end of the block or 100 yards away, are you firing at them? No, no, at that time we were all just uh, leaning up against the stone wall resting, you know. So they decided at night they to pull back a little bit. And of course we run the line. I got the machine gun, I stepped in the hole, the machine gun went flying. Because <laughs> it was pitch dark, you know. And uh, the whole problem was we didn't take the town. So that night when we retreated a little bit, they blew the bridge up in Massa. They'd been known for blowing all the bridges up, you know. So yeah. that's, what, that's what happened there. But then we went in the next day. How about being getting wounded? Uh, that was a little further down when uh, uh, we got to another hill. And we were going up the hill. And this is when they were throwing water shells in. I don't know what else they were throwing in, but everything was, everything was coming in. The road, when we went up the road, it was hardly a hole in the road, but when we left to get out of there after I got wounded, there would look like there was a square inch on the road that didn't have a hole in it. So they they have everything figured out. When they move to the next one, you know, just what to do to them, where they were before. And we're going up the side of the hill, and it was really uh, coming in pretty thick, and all of a sudden I felt, you know, something on my leg, and there was a piece of shrapnel in my, right to, on, my, on my knee right at the, on the side of my knee. Was this, say, from a mortar blast? Or? Yeah, I guess it was a mortar shell. And they, the fellow that was with me, uh, blood was coming out of his mouth. So I guess he, he, maybe he took the major part of it. I don't know, but he was gone. And the worst part about that was that he was with me and his brother was in France. And his brother got killed and he says, oh, I wish that had been me. And he ended up getting killed also. Are these the same guys that you were with uh, from the beginning? Are, are these the southern guys that no, or no, had your the outfit changed but, as you Like I say, when we uh, flew over in the plane, uh, I don't think we're, we were kind of all mixed up. In fact, even when we were on the boat, they, some of the people on the train came under heavy guard. In other words, they had been AWOL and things like that. So they went in and they put them on the boat. But uh, no, I don't think so, because when we flew over, the, the first plane landed, and when we uh, got there with our plane, everybody was gone. You know, we didn't know anybody there. They were moving them around so fast. Okay, now back to where you were in Italy. How, how well did you know the people around you, the, seeing Boy, people I, killed? Well, you knew the unit and things like that. In my small unit, we weren't a very big unit, but uh, everybody knew everybody else, I guess, yeah. 473rd Infantry Company A, that's what it was. What did they do for you uh, when you're, you got a, a wound when in your they got, When I got my wounded in the knee, I crawled. I went down to, they would have like a first aid. Well, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a tent, but it was a building, and they were outside the building dressing wounds and things like that. So he slapped something on there and wrote me out a tag. Just a mass unit? Just a regular, well, I guess it was the uh, people that go, that go with the infantry, you know, they just uh, yeah. take care of the wounded. Did you feel you got good medical care, Jim? Uh, well, <laughs> that was another thing. But anyway, when we got there, they took us, a, they got brought a jeep up and then they hauled us away to the first aid station further down. And I'm laying there and uh, the doctor came by and looked at it and says, gee, that, that's nothing, you know. But fortunately it was 12 o'clock, it was time for lunch. And I was laying on the board and the doctors decided it was time to go to lunch. So I had to wait on the board until they came back from lunch. Did so you I, get the same doctor after lunch? After lunch, they came and took care of it, yeah. But it, they had a regular, like a building they were using for a hospital at the time. If it's not too personal for you, was this wound one that you still suffer from in any way? Well, I don't know if I really suffer from it. Actually, there's still a little piece of shrapnel in there. They didn't take it all out. Whether there was a bigger piece in there or what, I don't know. But they, there's still a little tiny, tiny. I always kid everybody at home. I said, you want to see my operation? <laughs> Do you get many takers? <laughs> <laughs> then I have an x-ray too. I said, you want me to look at it on the x-ray with you? <laughs> Does this, this ring off bells in airports or anything like that? Well, 
I do go on airports, but sometimes my wife thinks it's my suspenders. But I don't have them on today. But I, I don't know whether it is or not. But then one time I had some uh, locks that went on the luggage, and I took them off well, so they couldn't look at them. You know, and I had them in my pocket, so it did go off, I guess. And okay. They, they looked at my shoes, and they said, well, you got metal things going down your shoes and all that. And then my wife got stopped, too. And they said to her, your bra strap is throwing it off. I said, I can't believe that they were that sensitive, that a little bra hook <laughs> would, would set off a radar on I'm it. not sure we we'll pursue that at the moment, but <laughs> where, did, where were you sent after that? Did you, were you sent back to your unit? Well, there was a question when I got to the hospital. They said, uh, when I'm all cured, they said, well, do you want to go back to your unit or take a reassignment? That was a two bad words, reassignment, you know. I said, well, why not, you know. At this time, we were up in Leghorn, Italy. And they shipped us, we went on a boat, they shipped us all the way down to Naples with a bunch of German prisoners. They, we were on the same boat, we were all down to Naples. Let's back up just a second. Uh, what is this reassignment stuff? Well, uh, where you, you can you go back to go to, back to your outfit, or you can go back to your outfit that you were with when you got wounded. They were probably doing guard duty on prisoners at yeah. that time because the war was over. And uh, I said, no, I think I'll take reassignment. What What was the basis for that decision? Why Why not go back to your own outfit? I don't, I don't know. I just thought, I, well. See what happens, you know. I don't know. I just, I just said it, and I probably regret saying it, but that's what happened. Now the war in Europe was over at that time. Yes. So yes. you're on a boat with a, a bunch of German German prisoners and a lot of soldiers. We were going down. The outfit I was with was going down. They're to shipping you down to Naples. Naples. Okay. And what happened in Naples? Uh, they put us in a camp there. They changed. We went to the 591st Signal Depot, and uh, they were. Uh, didn't I didn't realize at the time they were going over to the major or whatever it is. I don't believe it was the major, but they said the major volunteered his outfit for the Pacific. So we had to wait around a while, and then we got on a a navy ship came in and all full of you know soldiers, and uh, they shipped us to Naples through the Panama Canal to New Guinea and up to Manila in the Philippines. Forty days on water, and I were was you, in the Were Army. you retrained? Uh, you, it's a signal outfit now. Yeah, it just it, it was all we were doing over there is uh, uh, just guarding place, different things and stuff like that. We weren't really doing anything. You weren't into communications or anything like no, that. No, no. My notes tell me that uh, two days after you went through the Panama Canal, and you're out into the Pacific Ocean now. Yeah. The war ended. The war ended. Now, is right. this the war in Asia and in Japan? The, when the whole war ended, yeah, they signed. They stopped in Japan. They well, it was over. So everybody started throwing their gear over because they figured they weren't going to need it when they get over there. Then they perked up and says, "Well, no, if you know, you're going to have to uh, pay for all that stuff you're throwing overboard." So you had to dive over quickly. And, <laughs> and then there was one incident as we were coming. Uh, we went through this Gibraltar there. I get up to see the, you know, going through Gibraltar. And we get down in the Caribbean there. And uh, you know these freighters, they have like wooden life rafts. Mm -hmm. And apparently one was in the water. So they didn't know whether it was a decoy or whatever it was on the Navy ship, you know. So they all they come running, the Navy personnel came running down with their BARs and all their guns and all that. And they're standing there looking over the railing. But it went on the other side of the ship, <laughs> so he didn't even see it. <laughs> Two days after the Panama Canal, evidently, somebody made a decision to continue you guys yeah. for another. Well, I think it was probably the fact that they didn't know what to do with everybody, you know. So, so they, they keep you going, yeah. Keep on going. And you wound up in the Philippines. Yeah, we were on Cebu Island in the Philippines. They landed at Manila and then they shipped us down on another freighter to Cebu in the Philippines. Which wasn't a very big island, it was just that uh, where they had a uh, uh, 
disappear there, and the building was half all broken up and all that, and they were just uh, kind of guarding everything along there. Then they had a bunch of Filipinos, you know, doing work for them and things like that. And they used to pay them off in squid. I, I pay them off what? And with squid. You know, in the can, I says, I don't know about that. I thought, if you want to try it. But they, uh, they paid them off in that, and then they had a whole bunch of all the old beer, and then they had a bunch of flashlights, you know. And every day it seemed like you never saw them take anything, but everything kept going down and down and down. <laughs> I didn't know how they were getting it out of there, but they were taking it little by little. What was specifically your job at this time? Well, we were just more or less guarding the, uh, the installation down there, which was right on the water. Cebu is pretty far south. Uh, tell me about the well, weather at this time. Must have been hot and humid. Well, it was it was hot, but uh, it wasn't that bad. And one day we said, "Well, we'll take a jeep and we'll go all around the island." We got about halfway, and we says, "I think we better turn around and go back." We were going to try to go around the whole island to see it, but it was wasn't much there. You know, it's just a they had a whole bunch of uh, natives that lived across the street, and every now and then they would. Uh, take care of a pig or a chicken or something like that, you know, and I'm telling you, the squeals sometimes were simply awful. You must have at this time been counting your points, is that correct? What? The war's over. You it was over, gone yeah, home, and then... Uh, but you uh, didn't have enough points, is that it? That's it. Everybody was, I was writing too, and everybody was saying, well, we, you need to go home now because we have enough points. You know? And every now and then they chipped them take some of the people and move them over to Leyte. And when the freighter came, they'd put them on the boat to Leyte and then they would go back. But uh, it took a while. How long did it take? I'm not just sure how many days it took to go back, but... It, no, I mean, when did they finally agree that the war was over and you should go home? Well, it, it was a little while because, uh, uh, as I say, we weren't doing anything, so naturally everybody thought they should go home, but uh, you know, they'd go and buy points. But I would did so much running around, you know, dull here and yawn and stuff like that, that I didn't really have enough points to begin with, but finally I went home on points. Was the Purple Heart worth a, anything being wounded? Did you get 10 points for that or something? Uh, I don't remember getting any points for that. It really does, it gives you a little break on your taxes. You well, you had over a lot of overseas time, yeah, um, and then time in service. About when did they send you home? Uh, I'm not sure of that date. Uh, I would say it was nearer the fall because of when we uh, of forty five now. Yeah, yeah. When uh, we were coming home, we went back, came back on one of those freighters they made during the war. You know that. And, we came back every time it went along the water and the propeller would come up, the ship would shake a little bit. You weren't sure you were going to make it back to port. This is one of the Kaiser Victory ships? Yeah, they yeah. were all, uh, there was not, not any load on it, you know, more or less, you know. There was a lot of people there, but that's not a big load. What stops did you make on the way home? We didn't make any. We went from uh, Leyte right through to San Francisco. Really? Yeah. They didn't we got off at San Francisco, and we then got on a ferry and went up to Camp Stockton in California. And that's where they were shipping the people out of. Were, we, were you with guys, uh, w when you went on the ship that took you to the Philippines, you had taken this reassignment. Yeah. Therefore, you'd left the rest of your outfit in the Europe. The rest of the outfit was in Were you the Italy. only guy that, they were, that they did were this? They were in Northern Italy, and we went, uh, you know, we just went down to join the outfit down then by Naples there. And, uh, and away you went. All the different group of people. Yeah. Tell us about coming home. Going under the Golden Gate Bridge, getting off. Um, I don't you think went we, to Fort Stockton, is that right? Yeah, Camp Stockton. I don't. That's that's no longer there. They've uh, this, this, they've shut that down a long time ago. And but, you got uh, on a train, I take it. And you uh, get there and you think, oh boy, you know. And then you say, well, I'm going to get on land. But you get off of one boat onto another boat <laughs> off to Camp Stockton. And then of course the the train shipped us from uh, there all the way to Fort Devens. Got a train Back where you train. started. What was your rank at this time? Just a uh, uh, technician, I guess. Uh, just a low grade, out, private first class or something like that. It okay. wasn't, wasn't anything really. 
I'd have to look at the exact title. Go back for just a minute when you were in combat, if you would, and then we'll wind down. Um, you'd heard a lot about the Germans before you went over there, and then you met them, uh, and as a matter of fact, they wounded you in battle. Um, was it worse than you had feared or better than you had hoped? What about being in combat against well, the Germans? Well, it was the first part of the combat when we were going down this road with the tank, and of course the tank draws all the fire. And like I say, when I saw all the trees coming down and all the branches coming off the trees, and in fact, I, I did get a, a, a shell burst and I had a little thing on my shoulder and I just brushed it off, but it was burning in there a little bit, you know. But other than that, I'm telling you, it's a, it just is a little discouraging when you feel like that. You don't know whether your time is up or not. When you came home, uh, did you sit and talk with your family about your experiences? Uh, no, I didn't. Have you and done so son, since or written it all down? Or No, I should no. have written it down, but that my son has been after me to have something down. So he was the one that gave me the card, and that's why I called here to come down and do this. Well, we're glad you did. Have you joined in? It, it, when you got out of the service, did you join any reserve no, unit? No, my wife said that I should have joined the American Legion a long, long time ago. They would have, you know, helped you and stuff like that. But uh, no, I didn't join the American Legion until about maybe seven or eight years ago. And uh, every meeting now, there's lucky if there's eight people there. They meet every other month. I mean, once a month, you know. And it's lucky if you have eight people there. I'm telling you, it's, it's really discouraging. Have you received any veterans' benefits? Did you get yes, the I, GI uh, Bill or hospitalization? Yeah, that's when I had uh, I had the wound, and then I had when I was in the hospital, I recovered from my wound. They were shooting me with penicillin, and I got a bad reaction, and I had asthma. You know. Yeah. So uh, I claimed that when I got out, and so I was getting treatments for asthma when I was home, and I was taking prednisone, which is uh, you know it makes your bones get kind of brittle after a while, and. Then I, my back went on me, and but right now I'm getting 70 percent, so that helps. Like this, you get helps with your prescription. That's a disability. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you, does your old outfit have reunions, and have you gone? Uh, to any I of keep these? I keep looking in the paper, but I'm not sure that I've ever seen a reunion in the paper. You know, you have to get somebody that wants to. To uh, do it, and I don't think there's, you know. And also, when I was in the service in uh, Cebu in Italy, there, uh, the fellow that worked in the audio room says, "Well, today I'm going to put in everybody gets a good conduct medal." So he typed out a big letter, you know, put everybody's name on it, passed it into the commander, and next you know, everybody's got a good conduct medal <laughs> for no reason at all. I certainly, you know. <laughs> that was a, that must have been a very powerful letter. <laughs> well, I don't know. They, they just, I guess they passed them out, you know, just like, they know you don't get any benefits from them. You just get a purple heart. No, I mean, a good quantic medal and yeah. a ribbon, that's all. I, I'd like to ask you how important it was for you to serve, have served in the military. Well, uh, I try to do, uh, like I say, when I was up there in the front lines, I, I tried to do the best I could. Uh, but, you know, it's like I say, every time you were here, the Germans were there. And if you got up there, then the Germans were up there. So, I mean, they always time looking down on you, you know. I mean, you don't, you could uh, see, at night you could see blasts go off. Then you next you know you hear boom, you know. So they were so far away shooting big cannons down our direction, but I don't know that we ever got hurt or anything, but I mean, they, they were, they was always in control of something a little higher. Well, you were up against a good, good army. Yeah, yeah. One of the best in the world at the time, I guess. Can you tell us, uh, other than your, your knee, uh, how serving in the military has affected your life? Uh, well, it didn't, uh, after I, uh, 
I got drafted, and when I came back, I went back to uh, to school, and I finished my education, and then I went. Uh, after I graduated, I got a job working for Woodbury and Company. They were uh, stationary manufacturers, you know, letterheads and things like that. And uh, I got in there, and I spent. I was there for like 35 years. And now they've gone out of business. They're not open. They're closed. They're not open anymore. Was the education you got part of the GI Bill? Yeah. No. Well, it wasn't. Uh, we didn't really have a GI Bill because it was like a trade school, and a lot of people that went there thought that the government should supply them with all kinds of tools and things like that, you know. But the fact that they had those there already at school, they weren't about to give any more out. So that's what that went all the time rebelling that they wanted some tools to work with. <laughs> You've told us quite a story here today about your experiences. Is there any one experience that sticks out in your mind that maybe you tell your family about or that you lie in bed at night and think about and, and that one comes back more than any other. No, Could you I, tell us about that? I all the time rant about my, my wound in my knee. That's <laughs> my grandchildren coming and I said, well, do you want to see my, <laughs> my operation or something? And, and go and grab the uh, x-ray. But I don't do that anymore. If the x-rays are kind of faded away, but I have yeah. an x-ray. They've invented television stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about a memorable character? You met a lot of people, and they came and went in your life, but is there one guy or... S well, I, I just kind of felt sorry for the fellow that was my, uh, you know, carrying the ammunition from a machine gun that he got killed, and his brother had got killed in France, and of course he said that, you know, I wish it was me instead of him, and I just felt kind of bad when he got hit too because he was wasn't married and I guess his brother was married you know so then that was I really felt bad about that I, I know it's an odd question to ask you but was there a humorous experience in your life in 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 the in military service mm. something funny at boot camp or during training or on the ship uh. I think I wrote something down, but I forgot what I wrote down. I wrote something on a piece of paper, but I forgot. Like I say, when we went through the canal uh, and uh, they were looking for that rife raft, and I said they missed it, it was on the other side. But when we were on the ship to leave Italy, I got KP the first day. And I'm in the air, and everybody else is, you know, running for the, <laughs> for the guardrail. But it didn't bother me a bit, but everybody would come to grab their food and, and head even left port. <laughs> Those ships must have rocked a lot. Yeah. We're about at the, the end of the tape here, Jim, and I wondered if uh, there's anything I ha haven't asked you, if there's something that you'd like to add to the tape for the benefit of your family or well, somebody that's looking at this 50 years from now. And uh, yeah. one last thought before we close Well, here. like I say, I, I, my son really wanted it because I, I talk about it, but I never really, you know, sit down and really explain to him what I did. So he's the one that really wanted it. So that's why I, I came here. I did it for him. Okay, Jim, thank you very much. Thank you.